evening, everyone. Here, we have a special session by Commodore Shrikant Peshwa. So we'll be talking about the various dimensions of maritime terrorism. Commodore S.L. Deshwa has received the Nasena Medal and served in the Indian Navy for 32 years. So has held many operational and administrative appointments, including Principal Director at Naval Headquarters, Commodore Superintendent of Naval Aircraft Yard, Director at the Naval Institute of Aeronautical Technology, and Project Director of a major naval aviation project. He has also presented papers at various international seminars, and his articles have been published in various platforms. Welcome, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah, for the uh, wonderful introduction, senior officers, dignitaries, and friends, thank you for this opportunity for presenting a broad overview on maritime terrorism. We are all aware any discussion on the terrorism and its control cannot be complete without examining the dimension of maritime terrorism. The presentation will be covered as shown on the slide. The maritime terrorists of the modern day seem to have quite familiarization with the Sudhu's strategic dictum, the enemy must now know where I intend to give battle, for if he does not know, he must prepare in great many places. And when he prepares in great many places, those I have to fight in any one place will be few, which makes combating maritime terrorism a difficult task. Maritime terrorism is not something new. Maritime terrorism finds reference in the literature going back to more than 2,300 years. Dr. Avantika Lal, in her book titled Ancient History Encyclopedia, Naval Warfare in Ancient India, has pointed out that the Navy in ancient India in the years 321 BC to 297 BCE carried out three important roles. It was used to transport troops to distant battlefields, participate in actual warfare, and primarily meant for protecting the kingdom's trade on sea, navigational rivers, and the maritime trade routes as have been depicted in the figure. But the modern maritime terrorism is technically much more sophisticated and can break very great havoc, thus much more difficult to tackle. World today is facing multiple problems on geopolitical, economic, and security fronts. Maritime terrorism has added to those problems very significantly, and it needs to be countered effectively for maintaining global peace and prosperity. India too has suffered from the maritime terrorism and it needs to be prepared to tackle the maritime terrorism problem, understanding its serious impacts. The task is obviously arduous, and the limited resource availability hampers the global efforts to combat maritime terrorism and the same problem is being faced by India. Though various measures have been initiated by many countries, including India, to counter the maritime terrorism, certainly a lot more needs to be done to control that menace. This presentation will thus focus on deciphering the nuances of maritime terrorism and the related aspects. To begin with, let's try and understand what maritime terrorism is. It has been defined by the security cooperation in Asia Pacific as undertaking of terrorist acts and activities within the maritime environment using or against a vessel or the fixed platforms at sea or in port or against any one of their passengers or personnel against coastal facilities or settlements including tourist resorts, port areas, and the port of some cities. We do see 
that the term maritime terrorism covers a vast uh, gamut. Another definition, which is based on the USA Code, sees the phenomena as any premediated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non combatant targets at sea by subnational groups or clandestine agents, adding a great political dimension to it. From the operational perspective, maritime terrorism is a typology based on utilization of maritime space and selection of the targets. It could be classified as use of sea as a medium for terrorist attacks on land-based targets. An example is the Mumbai bombings on 26 November 2008, when 10 terrorists landed on the city shores using the speedboats and carried out a series of coordinated attacks on the land targets. It could be hijacking of the naval vessels and the hostage taking by the terrorists. One of the most widely utilized maritime terror tactics in the conflict prone regions. The examples are the series of hijackings by the Abu Sayyaf in Sulu area C, the subsequent taking of the hostages and their brutal treatment. It may also come in the form of attacks on ports, facilities, or coastal installation. For example, in June 2018, Terrorists attacked the Libyan oil ports of Ras Lomf and El Saida, setting at least one storage tank on fire, following which the facilities were closed and evacuated. Or it could also be a terrorist attack against civilian ships and warships. Two Al Qaeda suicide bombers rammed an explosive laden dinghy into USS Coal on 12th October 2000, killing 17 U.S. service members. Facets we have examined so far are just the indicators of impacts of maritime terrorism. Let us now focus our attention on some details. The maritime terrorism endangers civilians, disrupts the economy, encourages corruption, and may also trigger an environmental disaster if attacks occur on congested sea lanes traversed by oil tankers. The cruise ships, ferries, cargo freighters are also big targets and present opportunities for the terrorists to inflict human casualties and economic harm. Concerns are also there that the extremists may seek to overcome operational hurdles by subcontracting to maritime criminals and this aspect is being closely watched by the world. There are also fears about use of ships as floating bombs or as delivery vehicles for explosive devices, perhaps even the nuclear ones for attack against passenger ships to cause maximum fatalities or other ships to sink them to produce a maximum of economic damage by blocking congested and narrow waterways such as the Malacca Straits or the Suez Canal or it could be attacks on ships to cause decapacitating environmental damage affecting the blue economic of very many countries. Some of the identified maritime terrorist groups which are being watched cover liberation of tiger, uh, Tigers of Tamil Ilan, which are under control now, the Palestine Liberation Organization, Free Act Movement in Indonesia, ASG group and the Moro National Liberation Front and the Splinter Group, the Moro Islami Liberation Front in Philippines, Jema Islamia, which has apparently also been involved in planning of maritime terrorism. Al Qaeda obviously figures in the list, which has assembled its own small fleet, and the Shi's efforts, who normally deal with environmental related issues. Allow me now to shift gear to the maritime terrorism in Asia and India, which is our area of interest. In the recent years, seaborne terrorism has emerged as a major security threat in the littoral Asia. Since November 2008 attacks in Mumbai, 
where the 10 Pakistani terrorists infiltrated the city from sea, killing 166 people and injuring over 300. The regional watchers have been wary of the possibility of another attack from the seas. Within India's security establishment, this anxiety has been quite palpable and understandable. In another instance, in November 2014, IS-affiliated militants commanded an Egyptian Navy missile boat in a bid to attack Israeli targets in the Mediterranean Sea. In the Red Sea, how the rebels have attacked Saudi and Emirati forces in which seemingly inspired by Al-Qaeda. A mine hit on the UAE petrol ship in 2015 is an example. The drone boat attacks, which is the new tactics on the Saudi Navy frigate in 2017, demonstrated the rebels' growing progress. In November 2018, intelligence emerged that Pakistan-based militant outfits lashkar e taiba and jaish e mohammed had been training their cadres to execute another strike on indian ports cargo ships and oil tankers vigilance seemed to have dated this attempt reports have also emerged that pakistani militant commanders have been training volunteers at the modified training sites and the canals in lahore and faisalabad for what they call samundari jihad that is seabone jihad in another instance, in 2018, Indian National Investigation Agency, NIA, sought a red corner notice by Interpol against a counselor in Pakistani High Commission in Colombo for coordinating maritime terrorist attack in September 2019. The Saudi-led coalition claimed to have intercepted and destroyed an explosive laden boat launched from Yemen by the Houthis in that instance. Though increased vigilance has marginally reduced the maritime terrorism occurrences, advent of technology has made the threat of terrorism more potent and ominous. Thus, the constant vigil and the effective measures have become an inescapable necessity. Therefore, the time has come to examine some of the countermeasures which have been put in place by the various countries including India. The United States has been at the forefront of the moves to enhance the global maritime security, including the Container Security Initiative, the International Ship and Port Facility Security Code, the Proliferation Security Initiative, and the Customs Trade Partnership against terrorism. USA has also been instrumental in sponsoring regional maritime security initiatives and capacity building in areas given high priority in U.S. counter-terrorism strategy. In our region, Singapore has adopted a coordinated and a multi-layered security regime designed to tackle the terrorist threats in both land and maritime domains and has set up agencies like Singapore Marine Crisis Center to tackle this issue. India too has bolstered its infrastructure for countering maritime terrorism with better maritime domain awareness and information sharing, emphasizing rapid response in dealing with criminal and terrorist threats. A new information fusion center in Gurugram, set up as an adjunct to the Indian Navy's information management and analysis center, has been collating, assembling, analyzing and sharing data related to maritime security matters with the neighboring states in Indian Ocean, making cooperation much more potent. The transporter systems that have been and are being installed on the fishing boats and the biometric cards issued to the fishermen, many of whom have become the eyes and ears of maritime security agencies, has helped in strengthening the battle. The setting up of the committee focused on maritime security has been another significant step forward. Following 2611 incident, India has established a national committee on strengthening maritime coastal security to bring 
मल्टीपल स्टेक होल्डर्स टूगेदर एंड फाइंड कलेक्टिव सोल्यूशन टू द कोस्टल सिक्योरिटी चैलेंजेस इट हैज ऑल्सो सॉट टू एड्रेस इंटर एजेंसी प्रॉब्लम इंप्रूविंग कोऑर्डिनेशन बिटवीन द इंडियन नेवी कोस्ट गार्ड मराइन पोलिस एंड अदर मराइन एजेंसीज India has also prioritized establishment of the national coastal radar chain and set up joint operation centers to monitor the exchange of information color coded fishing boats have helped the security agencies to better monitor the maritime environment wide shipping information sharing agreements have vastly improved the domain awareness the integrated underwater defense and surveillance systems comprising a networks of sonar electro optical sensors and the radars have made maritime domain awareness more effective making it hard for enemy divers to operate undetected however these measures are still inadequate as the technology is uh, enhancing the potential and the more certainly needs to be done to enhance both global and india's capabilities to tackle this terrorism menace some of the important corrective measures by usa need to cover policy level contributions to better safeguard the world oceans expansion of the post 911 maritime security regime and enhanced maritime security collaboration by conducting regular and the focused assessments it also needs to help in on redefining the mandates of the multilateral security arrangements to allow them a greater role in countering maritime threats encouraging the commercial maritime industry to make greater use of enabling communication and the defensive technologies and accept more transparency in its corporate structure is also equally important the united states needs to fund and support boosting the coastal monitoring and interdiction capabilities of states in area of the strategic importance international maritime bureau piracy reporting center needs to augment it it also need to help in augmenting port security management as well as fund the research into the cost effective initiatives for better securing ships and the ocean freight however asia also needs to do its bit at pan regional levels in that it must strengthen the four verticals namely intelligence threat levels and conditions vulnerability assessment and the force stroke facility protection measures for effectively combating maritime terrorism it also needs to work on reducing the prohibitive costs of many of the newly developed sensor technologies that need to be used for an important focus area making them affordable to the smaller states these sensors cover identification and authentication technology screening and surveillance assets and tracking and inspection systems asia also needs to develop a maritime security framework that enables capacity building in a way that the facilities and the ships can be hardened at affordable prices the solution may lie in the partnerships that would help to enhance capabilities to fight terrorism these include measures to protect commercial shipping maritime installations and the critical infrastructure in parallel states also need to act to deny funding and the sponsorship to the terrorist organization this will also involve identifying linkages with other terror groups and the safe havens that offer terrorist sanctuary another imperative would encompass an intelligence sharing network for maritime community which would help in preempting terrorist attacks how successfully a nation is able to combat maritime terrorism would depend on its ability to institute appropriate preventive measures as far as india is concerned 
it needs to focus on strengthening regional maritime domain awareness in that india needs to reevaluate its current mda policy to factor in extra state actors growing strategic ob objectives in the indian ocean it also needs to upgrade its mda capabilities in all the three domains to cater for monitoring of the foreign ships and the boats operating in a detrimental manner to india security for tracking growing presence of the foreign vessels in the bay of bengal and indian ocean regions and also for reducing violations of the india's eez by foreign ships and boats and underwater drones the one point which is important here here in the fishing boats which have been operating in REZ have been found to be armed and have also been found to do illegal fishing affecting economy as well as some of the ships have been found to have the capability to map the seabed then it also need to enhance its capability for countering the likely threats which are emerging from the enhancement in the technologies it needs to institute measures to monitor small shipping vessels boats dhows which are normally operating in ior to avoid any attacks from that channel educating the indian civil aircraft ships and fishing vessels operators in monitoring and reporting any suspicious activities to the monitoring centers can also help india also need to provide search and rescue oil spill control pollution control support to the littoral countries so that their abilities to help and coordinate maritime terrorism uh, measures can be bolstered we hope that the above initiative would make india capable of effectively countering the maritime terrorism threats which are emerging to not only to protect its own blue economy but also of that of the littoral states thereby uh, keeping the friendship bonds alive in the conclusion i would like to say that maritime terrorism has assumed varying dimensions in the recent years attacks on the civil and military ships have displayed the horrifying dimensions and impacts of maritime terrorism like dangers to civil population disruption of the economy encouragement to corruption and the trigger for environmental disasters if attacks occur in the congested sea lanes travels by the oil tankers asia and india have also been victims of the maritime terrorism knowing impacts of maritime terrorism many coordination measures have been initiated by various countries including usa singapore and india however with the newer technologies becoming available to the terrorists many new measures like use of advanced sensors which are affordable frequent patrols which are coordinated with many nations and the enhancement in the mar mar maritime domain awareness need to be instituted on priority we in our group have also always priority the make in india uh, initiative and have been helping indian authorities in monitoring out at sea thank you very much for this opportunity thank you for patient hearing jai hind thank you sir So we have a questions. I'll be more than honored to answer them. Thank you. Right, sir. Uh, so the first question is: How is piracy different from maritime terrorism? Basically, maritime terrorism is a coordinated activity by groups who are well versed with the technologies, who have got the wherewithal and the funding to amass the weapons as well as the explosives. and their main aim is to cripple the economy of their target nation or cause a psychological psychological damage to the populace by human killings or any other atrocities as compared to that 
normally the pirates do not have the coordinated funding in their hand they are normally the groups who come from the lower strata they do not have the uh, good standing in their own country or their areas of operation so their main aims are only to attack the ships and uh, platforms to gain money as well as uh, rather enrich themselves by utilizing that money however a danger which is coming up now as i pointed out in my presentation today coordination between the terrorist groups and the outsourced terrorism the terrorism could also be outsourced to the pirates and that's going to be very difficult situation for any country to tackle because pirates hide in the cows and the areas which are not easy to monitor or to counter them or capture them therefore we really need to understand this clear cut difference between the pirates as well as the maritime terrorist groups and the possible cooperation between them and be prepared to tackle that issue in a very uh, cogent manner so that we do not suffer the way we have suffered in 2611 thank you thank you sir the next question is can you highlight the relevance of choke points in the indian context to combat maritime terrorism and piracy frankly speaking so far we have been thinking malacca straits are the choke points but with the advent of technology where in the underwater drone technology and today underwater drones could also carry explosives with them this dimension is becoming more complex and just focusing on the choke points may not be a good strategy yes choke points is a good strategy to monitor the traffic flowing in and out from the choke points monitor any illegal shipping which passes through that is the importance of the wild shipping manifest which need to be monitored but the choke points are more important from protection of the country's maritime trade as well as the blue economy but from the counter terrorism point of view the choke points are only the monitoring points but tackling them has to be out at open seas because no terrorist will try and attack you there but the problem is going to be that if terrorists attack a ship near your uh, choke points like malacca straits and sink a ship or a tanker in that area causing humongous oil pollution killing the fishing well as well as affecting the water quality and stop the ships communication in and out of the straits then we are in a big trouble so our focus needs to be that no terrorist group or any uh, uh, rogue uh, operating agent will be able to attack a ship and sink it at the choke points that's very very important for us thank you so the next question is uh, the recent docking of the chinese spy ship in sri lanka is worrisome for india's security is there anything we can do to counter that or prevent that in the future since diplomacy didn't work this time basically you have raised a very important point uh, from the india security point of view unfortunately when we talk of the open seas and the open uh, water boundaries operations of the ships cannot be stopped the records are available that china has been operating its ships its survey ships its uh, scientific ships under the garb of scientific missions of survey mapping etc however it it is suspected that the ships are capable of doing the seabed mapping understanding the contours understanding the sub water temperatures which are very more very much important for the operations of the submarines in that area therefore india has always been wary of the surreptitious so called survey operations of chinese uh, ships in that area and they have also been operating very close to andaman and nicobar which are very much important for us of our own maritime security so always we have been objecting to the operations of the chinese ships in that area and sometimes we are literally driven them away the only problem which comes to us is that when they start operating in the open waters you really can't object to them and they are carrying out the data gathering missions which may facilitate their long term uh, operation of the nuclear submarines in and around india 
which is not good for India's prestige in IOR as well as the blue economy in that particular region. That is the reason we have always been objecting for docking of such ships in Sri Lanka, etc. But we need to understand Sri Lanka is a country by itself. It has its own bilateral relations. We can lodge a protest. We can request them not to do that. But an independent country takes a decision to dock a Chinese ship in their own shipyard. Rather, the Ambantota shipyard is under the 99 years lease under the debt trap with China. So it's a very difficult situation. In such a situation, India really needs to be very uh, potent in its own approach in tackling with its neighbors. It must develop the friendly uh, countries, increase its investment in those countries so that you develop much softer bonds which will help you in countering such measures or such operations by China as well as we also need to coordinate patrols and other issues with our literal countries so that India's own assets could be available for actual counterattacks on any terrorist ships or other measures like that. Therefore, the regional cooperation either under BIMSTEC or under ASEAN seems to be the only way going forward. But for that, we also need to be very pragmatic and increase our investment levels in the friendly countries who are supporting us. That is what I would like to say about the menace of the Chinese ships in and around our areas and the implications what they can have on our own security. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank you for this short but enlightening session. I'm sure all of us have a good idea of what maritime terrorism is by now and how it affects all of us. I kindly ask the audience to stay back for our next session on India and Israel's counterterrorism strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I just say a, a few words? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, yes, I would like to really, uh, really compliment you for including this uh, dimension of a maritime terrorism in this discussion, though it is a little offbeat for the theme of this uh, complete organization of the session, what you have done. But this is a very important dimension. It does need to be linked with other terror activities. So to get the holistic perspective of the terrorism and what we need to do, the counter-terrorism activities. My compliments. Thank you so very much. Jai Hind.